Before the year ends, we got to do one last thing when it comes to anime, and that is reviewing shows. I viewed 33 different anime for the fall season 2023. Let's talk about it. Welcome back, everybody, to the channel. Today, we're going to talk about the fall season and all 33 anime that I watched. It was pretty exhausting. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to bore you with all the details. Let's just get right into it. Towards the end of this video, I'm doing things a little bit different. I am combining the top anime of 2023 video into this. So we're merging two videos into one because a lot of the shows that I'm going to talk about here do show up in the top 20 and I don't want to make the same video twice, basically. So yeah, let's do it. Stardust Telepath. This is an anime based on the manga of the same name, and it's done by Studio Gokumi. This tells the story of Konohoshi Umika, a high schooler with very bad communication skills. She is extremely shy, which is a theme you're going to see throughout this video with a lot of shy characters. And she sort of feels like an outcast, pretty alien to the rest of the world, and she wishes to meet an actual alien until one day she meets this girl called uh, Yu Akeuchi who claims to be an actual alien. Hilarity ensues and if you enjoy stuff like Bochi the Rock for example you'll be sort of right at home with this. I don't think it is as funny but it is definitely wholesome cute with a great artistic direction. I love the coloring and the uh, the character designs for Stardust Telepath even with the wacky premise. I mean, literally, Akeuchi's telling everybody that she's an alien, but we don't really have an answer for that. We just uh, assume that she is, or maybe she's not, who knows? The next show is Shy. On the brink of the Third World War, superheroes finally started appearing on Earth. Gifted with these powers, they finally bring peace to the world. The heroes each selected a country in which they would preside, serve, and protect its citizens. Shai happens to be Japan's hero, endowed with super strength. However, she has crippling shyness. I think 8-Bit Studios did a phenomenal job bringing this to life. The character designs are great, the coloring is fantastic, and the overall animation is really solid. The fight scenes are well made, however, where I think the story falls a little bit short is with the antagonist. I wasn't really that invested, and I thought it was pretty, you know, in the pantheon of super heroics, I think it's just an okay threat. Maybe that's just me. But we have the character of Teru. She is a phenomenal hero. I love that she's shy, but she wants to succeed, and I hope she gets there. We also have the character of Pepesha. Unfortunately, Pepesha is a <laughs> stereotype of being a Russian hero, so you know they're gonna have her drinking a lot of vodka, which I thought was pretty silly. But Pepesha has genuinely a great story arc and a backstory that I was invested in, so she actually became my favorite character in Shy. Maybe I'll have to read more, maybe I'll have to watch season 2 when it drops, but I just thought that it had a fun concept, it just needed that extra oomph. The Saint's Magic Power is Omnipotent Season 2, and I have to be completely honest, I barely remember what happened in Season 1. I had to go back and do a little bit of research, but we still follow the adventures of Say, an office worker in her 20s. She was accidentally summoned as a second summon, if you will, to be the Saint hero. She feels a little left out, but they soon discover that she may actually be the Saint and not the other one that was originally intended to be summoned. So that sort of happens in season one she gets accustomed to that world and meeting all the wonderful characters and dealing with a lot of emotional issues and self-doubt and finding her true strength and how she can contribute to the kingdom so now after that first season we are here with the second one where she basically helped out and now is on her last duties for the kingdom where they need to clear the miasma and all the dark creatures and all that stuff and sort of make the place a lot safer. 
There are some genuinely high points here with Say's evolution as a protagonist and how she gains more confidence in herself and becomes such a powerful force within the kingdom and impacts the lives of many. This is a beautifully acted show. I really enjoyed the finale for it, and I know the manga and light novel are still releasing. I'm hoping we can get a season three or maybe a movie or something because there is more story to be told. They do wrap up a lot of things, but the world is big enough and there are some plots introduced that I think could be explored on a season three, hopefully. Tokyo Revengers season two, part eight. Two. This is one of my most anticipated ones for the season, and I have to unfortunately say I was really underwhelmed by this show. I love Tokyo Revengers. I've been following it since day one, since the first episode. I don't know what happened with Leiden films. They could be hit or miss, and I think this was a miss. The story's there. The characters are there. The voice acting is phenomenal in this show. Unfortunately, the animation side of things was really underwhelming. Very staticky and not fluid at all. The definition on these characters is very weak this time around. There are a lot of fights, especially towards the ending of the season. Some of these characters get really beat up and we just get like splashes of the brightest red you can imagine and bruising that just is not up to par. I think you could have done a way better job. Even though I was enjoying the story, it wasn't what I wanted. I thought it was very okay at best. The next one that we're going to talk about is Helk. I reviewed the first half on the summer season review, and for the majority of the second half of Helk, we take a look at Helk's journey, his story, and all the traumatic events that happen, which is great, but this being a 24 episode series, I think they devoted way too much on Helk's story. I don't think it needed as many episodes as it did. I think you could have condensed some things and I actually wanted to see more fighting or more interactions with the demon characters outside of what we saw in part one. This time, I really wanted to see more of Vermilio. She's my favorite character in this, and I don't feel like I got that 100%. I understand and I like the journey that we went through, but I don't know. If it were me, I would have done things just a little bit different. I know it's adapting the manga, obviously, but I can't say that I absolutely love this. The animation was all right as well. Nothing too spectacular, but, you know, pretty serviceable. I'm giving the disgraced noble lady I rescued a crash course in naughtiness. This is based on a light novel series and a manga adaptation as well. First impressions, I thought this was going to be raunchy or maybe etchy crossing into the H territory. Fortunately for everybody, I am happy to say this was not the case. The actual naughtiness part of it refers to this noble lady, Charlotte Evans, and how she was exiled on false charges. She meets up with Alan Crawford, a sorcerer who's known as the Dark Lord. Lord. He's also been betrayed. So the two of them find each other and become a master apprentice, but also a potential love interest. And it's all about how Alan is now teaching Charlotte how to be a commoner, basically, and do things that she's never experienced, like eating more sweets than she's allowed, being more outgoing, staying up at night. I don't know. Stuff like that. It's very silly, wholesome, heartwarming. Not what you were originally thinking of when you read the title. <laughs> This is an anime adaptation done by Zero G and Digital Network Animation, and for the most part, it's pretty serviceable, which is perfectly fine. Nothing too exciting that would make this one of my top shows of the year, but it wasn't bad. Volbuster. This is based off a light novel of the same name, and shockingly, it does not have a manga adaptation. It went straight from light novel to anime. This is pretty unique. It is an anime done by Nut Studios. Yes, I said that right. They are the ones that handled uh, Decadence from a few years ago. And in Bold Buster, we follow this team who is seeking government funding to eradicate mysterious monster creatures that are appearing on an island off the coast of Japan. On this small town, the monsters are wrecking everything up and terrorizing the populace 
violence and uh, you know it's a dangerous thing and nobody's taking it serious except for this team that is uh, working hard to make that happen they need to get approval for a lot of things and this falls this anime falls more on the bureaucracy and the critique of the government and all that stuff where you have all these characters going through all the paperwork of filing things getting approval getting budgets they have these robots to help with the labor and to help fight these monsters and these things cost an arm and a leg so you have one of the characters constantly going over the budget to the insane things like each round from a magazine costs this much so you can't be shooting wildly you have to be concise in what you do it's stuff like that the idea sounds fun until you start watching it and realize there is a lot of politics but it's not exciting politics it's just very mundane things the concept is fine, it's just the execution was just underwhelming and not the most exciting thing. But if you're into the management aspect of a series like this with high tech stuff, creatures and other hijinks, I think you'll be right at home with Bull Buster. It's a pretty unique series, if you ask me. Just okay in its direction. 16-bit sensation another layer this anime is adapting the manga of the same name and this was produced by studio silver this i really really wanted to enjoy i love the premise for this but i feel like halfway it just went off into the craziest direction that i wasn't a fan of it wasn't what i was expecting let me explain a little bit we follow this character Konoha Akisato. She's an illustrator that loves doing the Bishoujo Beautiful Girls PC games that are very famous in Japan. They were a hit in the late 80s, early 90s, and they've sort of evolved through the ages. We see stuff like the uh, visual novels take elements from the early Bishoujo games and stuff like that. I love when you have anime and manga reference real stuff like that, real like pop culture elements. This anime, we have the character of Konoha, like I mentioned, she is overworked at this game production company and isn't really doing what she set out to be. She's just a sub illustrator spending her days painting the backs of random characters in the game. On a particular day, she finds a small mom and pop shop in, I assume, Akihabara. And when she goes in, the old lady sells her an old Bishoujo game that was actually pretty famous. This is also pretty cool cool you have licensed tie-ins to real games so that makes it extra special if you enjoy that era so she opens the game and it acts like a plot device for her to time travel back into the 90s where she starts to work at a small indie game developer company creating Bishoujo games. This is all very wacky, but overall kind of nice. Unfortunately, where this falters is that at first I thought the animation was solid, but then it just got very serviceable and the story just starts going off into crazy directions. We have one of the main characters, Mamoru Rokuta, who works at that company in the 90s. At some point, small spoilers, he's able to use Konoha's ability and goes off into a time travel adventure with some aliens. Uh, Konoha travels back and forth to the present time, 2023, and back to the 90s. But when she goes back to the past again, it's at a different date. So I thought that was interesting that the characters uh, suddenly uh, don't see her. And when they finally do meet, it's been like 10 years or 20. That aspect is pretty cool for a time travel plot. But at some point, Konoha starts going into the future with some really wacky, like Saturday morning cartoon villain stuff happening here. So I, I, I don't know. I, I just think this plot just goes off the rails and I wasn't enjoying it. I like the fact that it paid tribute to a niche segment of gaming history, like I mentioned with uh, Bishoujo games. But overall, the idea was cool, but the end product just wasn't for me. I wasn't loving it that much. 
we have the return of Dr. Stone. Here we have New World Part 2, or Season 3 Part 2, where we have the conclusion of the Petrification Kingdom and that story arc. I think they handled it pretty well. A pretty straightforward adaptation. I love Dr. Stone. It is one of my favorite Shonen Jump series. Some of the animation is not as crisp and detailed as prior seasons, but they do a good job regardless, and when the key moments happen, it's pretty cool. The sound design and the voice acting and all that stuff from, from TMS Entertainment is there, and I I liked it. I, it gets even crazier after this when you realize the source of the petrification and what they're going to do next in the following arcs and where they're going to travel and all that stuff. It really brings a larger perspective on this world and makes you realize that this is a global story, not just about rescuing people in Japan. It's about the entirety of the human species, and that is pretty cool. And speaking of not liking stuff, I'm gonna upset some people. Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2, the long-awaited return for Jujutsu Kaisen. I have to admit, I'm having a tough time recording this video and talking about Jujutsu Kaisen because I know it is such a popular series and I know I'm gonna get some hate for this, but with peace and love, I don't really care about this show at all. I like some of the characters. I do not like the battle system mechanic thingamajig. Uh, the plot, I guess, is fine. The first arc I thought was really good and could have been a motion picture, actually. But then it goes into that famous Shibuya arc where they are trying to get Goto and they trap the whole uh, city of Shibuya and or mostly the uh, uh, subway system and everybody inside and all that stuff and just hell breaks loose and that's cool I don't mind that I think the action is really well made the animation is breathtaking at times and really creative Mappa went all out you could say like all the way out by overworking their staff to the point where they had to be censored for expressing that and it shows they they really made something special however the story I don't I don't know how to tell you but I just don't find it fun I don't like it. <laughs> and some of these characters, things happened to them that I felt was more like shock value, honestly. And I, I don't, I don't know. I'll watch it for the cool fights and stuff, but it's not something I enjoyed. And it took me this season to realize. Now switching over to something completely unrelated and not as wholesome is Under Ninja. I feel like I was too, like the show was too wacky for me. Let's just say that much. We follow a world in Japan where ninjas still exist. I think there's like 200,000 based on the official description. And there is a ninja organization called the National Intelligence of Ninja, not controlled by civilian government with its elite members performing assassinations in secret. However, there is an organization that opposes the NIN and they are called the UN or Under Ninja. So essentially, we have very weird characters interacting here. Everybody's odd. They all have a screw loose up in their head. This is that type of show where you highlight the mundane, but within it, you start peeling the layers and you see the eccentric side of modern Japanese uh, single household uh, disenfranchised individuals, orphan kids, and just random individuals and how they navigate through society with the backdrop of ninjas fighting against ninjas. This is a bloody show. It is somewhat risque in certain areas. And you have the character of Kudo, who might not be the most exciting protagonist of all time, but for some strange reason, you're hooked. This is based on the manga by the same creator of I'm a Hero, that is Kengo Hanazawa. And his character work is impressive. You meet some really unique individuals they're kind of twisted, but you can't help but look at them and examine how they go about, you know? I think I liked it, but if you're not paying attention, you're going to be confused because there are a lot of elements thrown without any explanation. Eventually, as you start watching the episode and digging deep into its lore, that's when you start realizing what you're looking at and the terminology, which characters on which side, etc., etc. So it's a pretty unique experience. I do recommend watching Under Ninja. I don't know, I just thought I was a little bit too confused by it at first and it made me not get it, but I kind of did by the end. The Yuzuki Family's Four Sons. Honestly, 
bit of a spoiler here. I think this is one of the best shows of 2023. I love this show so freaking much. It is such a wholesomely crafted drama family piece that really reminds me of the power of said concept of family. The fact that you have an older brother taking care of the three younger ones after their parents tragically pass away should cause endless amounts of grief and these characters are able to slowly bounce back and live their lives and I think that's a, a really powerful thing to see. You have the dynamic between these brothers which are uh, you know they all have their quirks and their good and bad qualities but they are very humanly written. There's no fan service, there's no silly plot devices, it's just a pretty freaking realistic take on the family dynamic and how it is able to survive under extreme circumstances when the absolute worst puts them to the test. The animation on this thing, Shuka Studios just went all out to animate the ever-living crap out of this manga. And a lot of other companies should be put to shame with the stuff that you see here. The, the background work and the way everything is shot and drawn, the <laughs> intersplicing of live action footage and how it so creatively blends with the story. There's a freaking fight scene between two kids and that is better animated than half the stuff I'm talking about in this video. It was really impressive. I highly recommend you check out the Yuzuki family's four sons. At certain points in the story, it genuinely brought me to tears. There were a couple episodes that reminded me of my own childhood and similar experiences. Although I don't have siblings, some of the stuff that happens it doesn't necessarily have to do with the sibling aspect. And it, man, nostalgia is a hell of a drug and it brought me back and really teared me up. I really enjoyed this show. It is such a unique adaptation. The Rising of the Shield Hero Season 3. After the conclusion of the much talked about Season 2, we're finally back to where we belong. I thought Season 2 was a mistake. I wish they could do it over because I did not like that whatsoever. And thankfully with Season 3, they fixed a lot of the issues that was plaguing the show. Kinema Citrus worked their butts off on this. It looks phenomenal. After seeing My Happy Marriage, I was wondering if they were going to bring that quality to this show. And I'm glad to see that they did. We find out in this third season that the next guardian beast is going to show up. So now Fumi has to gather the other three heroes who have gone missing. Unfortunately, the one downside of this season is the fact that it revolves around these other heroes. And I think they are just horrible characters, not just plot wise, but like the construction of these characters. I dislike no, I hate every single one of them. That's how bad it is. But, you know, it's about Naofumi and the village that he's made with all these new characters, all the beast folk and all that stuff. That's cool to see. We get more development for characters like Philo. I'm not going to spoil it, but I did enjoy that part. I thought it was pretty exciting and it made me anxious to see what would happen. And uh, just a better improved Rising of the Shield and Heroes series. Frieden. Beyond Journey's End. What a freaking revelation. Madhouse, they have done a phenomenal job of bringing this heavily underrated series to light. Frieden stars the character of Frieden, and this is an adventure unlike other fantasy series out there. We begin after the end of her party's journey in defeating the demon lord and she is destined to live a long life as an elf and mage of the hero party and what is her to do when the journey has ended how do you continue and process the fact that she is going to outlive her former party and start to understand the precious nature of life, how short it is for some people and how do you move forward and cherish those moments and build memories on that. I think this is a wonderfully emotional show with beautiful, breathtaking animation. I love Frieden. She's a fantastic character. She's kind of wacky and kooky, but in all the right ways. And now that her journey ended, she begins a new one with a new party, essentially. 
eventually, slowly but surely throughout the episodes, builds up a new party, and she goes on this new mission. And through that mission, we learn about the world, we learn about the previous hero party and what they were like and all that stuff. So genuinely a great drama slice of life piece that I think everybody should experience. The manga is one of my favorite ongoing manga and the anime is just as good. So definitely uh, do check out Frieden Beyond Journey's End. Undead Unluck from David Production. We finally have the adaptation for this manga. I feel like we've known about this anime for a while and it's finally out. I'm happy to report that I'm really excited about it. I think they knocked it out of the park. I'm not the biggest fan of the manga, but I don't know. David Production has the ability to elevate whatever the hell it is they're adapting and make it as fun and bombastic as possible. The sound design is great. The character work is great. The voice acting, I love it. It has some really great actors on this and the story is just wacky enough that it makes David's sensibilities as a studio uh, come out even more and uh, it's just a really uh, action-packed like Hollywood-esque adventure. I really enjoy this. Undead Unluck follows the character of Fuko Izumu. She has the unluck ability that makes it impossible to touch other people. If you do touch her physically, it's going to bring about horrible luck and catastrophe. So she's led a very solitary life and seeks to end it all one day. When she tries to, she fails and she meets the character of Andy who has the undead ability. He's basically a walking, living zombie, immortal creature. And he's looking for a way out after so many years living on earth, finding a way to end his life. So the two of them partner up and at first they are unlikely to do so there are they are very different from each other but they sort of click and this is a world where we have negators that are able to negate the rules set about by god and the universe and all that stuff and they embody the uma now what the hell is a uma that is the unidentified mysterious animals that are created by god so those are the type of rules that we're dealing here it's pretty wacky it's unconventional I, like I mentioned, I'm not a huge fan of the manga. I did read some of it. I'm not up to date with it, but I feel like the anime did a really good job of uh, making me want to read this. It was bombastic enough that I want to check it out. Oh boy, the kingdoms of ruin. <laughs> How the heck do I describe this? This, I, I knew from the get-go that it was going to be a bad show. The premise isn't that great, but I was not prepared for the levels of cringe and edginess from uh, The Kingdoms of Ruin. This is a manga story adapted by Yokohama Animation Lab. And I guess they do a good job. I don't know. I thought it was pretty okay. The fact of this story is that witches once blessed the human race with wisdom and peace, but the evil empire that controls the majority of the earth uh, is the Redia Empire. I think that's what it's called. And they hate the witches. Uh, they are uh, pretty racist towards them and they want to kill them. They are an abomination, a sin of earth or whatever. And when the story begins, we follow the character of Adonis. He is the apprentice of the famous witch Chloe. Spoilers. Chloe, uh, they're tracking her down because she's pretty, she's one of the strongest witches. Unfortunately, she dies and Adonis is in shambles, distraught. But being the apprentice, he's a human. But being a human makes him a bad guy. The people in this world do not take lightly that he would cross over uh, and be with the enemy or their enemy. So Adonis gets imprisoned. That just happens at the first half of the first episode. I'm not spoiling anything. Eventually, spoilers, Adonis breaks free and wreaks havoc on this world and starts murdering people left and right. Did I mention murder? There's a lot of murder in this show, sometimes in pretty gruesome and creative ways. It was so bad that I, I was kind of digging it, but unfortunately, it just goes on and on with the cringe and this edgy dialogue of Adonis just being blinded by his own rage where you have sensible characters telling him like 
dude, chill out. We're witches and we're going to help you exact revenge, but you need to calm down. No, he's not going to have it. He's going to murder everybody, even the witches. It doesn't matter. He's murdering everybody. He wants to avenge Chloe and uh, he's going to become the devil himself to do it. There is this girl called Doroka and for some reason she's interested in Adonis. I don't know why. This character seems like the worst person to be around, but she, I guess, due to the law of being the female sidekick is demanded to be <laughs> next to Adonis as the second lead character here. The journey starts off pretty rocky and some of the stuff that happens is just bad. <laughs> Don't watch this. The second season of Spy Family finally showed up and I think it was okay. I didn't love it as much as I did with the first one. It starts out with a lot of episodic adventures for the Forgers and then it goes into one big arc which was the highlight for me. I did enjoy that where Yor has to uh, protect a secret uh, client at a cruise. So hijinks ensue and the whole family actually ends up going to said cruise and I I thought that was easily the best part. Uh, the rest of the episodes were fine. The animation is just as good as season one. Uh, it was definitely a delight. Even though I say I didn't like it as much as season one, this is a well-crafted show and easily one of the best ones of the season. Butareba, the story of a man turned into a pig. Oh boy. The premise is wacky enough that I immediately wanted to check this out. We follow this character, we don't know his real name, so we're just gonna call him Buta, uh, as in pig, and he awakens one day in the body of a pig. He's been isekai'd into another world after eating, I think it was raw pig liver. They don't dwell on it too much, we're just going along for the ride. He's now in this new world and he finds himself in the company of this young girl called Jess. She is a different sort of human, kind of reminded me of gypsies, and she's able to telepathically communicate with Buta. So we have the conversation between the two characters, and now Buta is learning about Jess. He's kind of a perv otaku shut in, so those traits are going to pass on to his pig self. So you can probably imagine. There are some heartwarming moments, but the story is so bizarre and quirky that I have a tough time recommending Butareba to people. The art, on the other hand, I thought was going to be excellent from project number nine, but a majority of the time, it's just very mediocre. There are some highlights on the key moments, but as an animation fan, I was kind of let down by this show. There's a mystery for uh, Jess's race and how after, I think it's 13, 14 years or something, they are tasked with returning to the central kingdom. And a lot of people are out there hunting these girls for what they are. So yeah, there's a discrimination and some darker elements throughout the story because of that fact, which might not appeal to a lot of people. It can be a little uh, triggering and traumatizing some of the things that happen to these girls. But Buta's journey of being less of a weirdo and uh, befriending Jess is quirky enough that I wanted to tune in and, and keep the story going, I guess. A Returner's Magic should be special. This is based off a Webtoon comic, if I remember correctly, and it's sort of a uh, time travel meets Isekai story. We have the character of Dezir. I probably butchered that name and at the start of the show he is on his way out of this world after he's defeated this uh, destruction dragon along with his teammates but it doesn't go as planned. Dezer loses his battle against the dragon with his teammates and as he is convinced that he's just going to pass away he finds himself 13 years in the past in this isekai world I guess. So now that he's gone back in time, he has an opportunity to rewrite all the wrongs and face the upcoming apocalypse in a different manner. There are several characters that he lost, several friends that died, now they're back. So he has a second chance in life, if you will, to fix all that stuff. The premise is cool. However, when you have a solid introduction like that, and then to be followed by school life, action, drama, if you will, it all made for a very loud lackluster experience. I know this has a ton of fans that enjoy the original comic, but for the most part, I thought it was just pretty meh 
if that's a word that we can still use on the internet. <laughs> the animation's serviceable, I guess. The characters are fine. Everything was just okay. Tier Moon Empire. This is essentially a reverse time story where you have the character of Mia Luna Tier Moon. She is a very selfish princess. And unfortunately, similar to the French Revolution, she ends up under the guillotine, assassinated for her crimes against the country. But luckily for her, she learned a little bit of humility before her death and is sent back in time to when she was younger and now has to right the wrongs that the kingdom committed, her family, king and queen and all that stuff. And as a princess, she starts making political moves of her own and befriending other younger kids that are in the, the royal families, if you will, and hoping that these connections are evergreen and the same thing doesn't happen where she loses her life. So I thought that was a fun premise. It has a lot of romantic elements sprinkled throughout, but the character of Mia, she is funny and heartwarming enough that I was invested to see where the story was headed. I didn't really like some of the story elements when she goes off into a school and it suddenly becomes this slice of life dating show, but when she's dealing with the political stuff and how they manage the effects that the Empire has on the population and how she can better the, the people out there by taking care of the sick and, and the needy and all that stuff, I think the show really excelled when it touched on those subjects. Easily one of the best shows of the season, Apothecary Diaries finally debuted. I've been wanting to read the manga for a while, I haven't, so I was very excited to jump in with the anime and I was surprised with how much I enjoyed the show. We follow the story of Mao Mao as she is living a peaceful life with her apothecary father until one day she's sold as a lowly servant to the Emperor's palace. Her knowledge of medicine is going to come in handy as she is now a servant working for the concubines of the royal head of the country. This is a fictional country based on Ming era China. So it's pretty interesting. I like that it's going for this historical fiction, if you will. I love the animation. It is phenomenal. OLM never disappoints. They're one of my favorite studios. I love the character of Mao Mao. She is fantastic, quirky and spunky and really speaks her mind. Super intelligent, knowledgeable. Uh, she's kind of a trickster too, a mixed bag of elements here that make her a very compelling character and uh, how she traverses through this dangerous journey and all the different political conspiracies and the illnesses that occur within the kingdom. I think it's all fascinating and I can't wait to continue. Actually, I want to pick up the manga and continue the story from there uh, from what I've seen of the show. The Vexations of a Shut-In Princess. You have here an anime that I was not expecting to like, but I kind of dig it. We follow the character of Terakomari Gandisblood. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And she is a vampire princess, heir to the throne of a very powerful imperial army nation. And she just happens to be a shut-in. One day she is made to be the next heir to the kingdom and she is leading her own army of ruffians. And she has to keep up the front that she's a shut-in, nobody can know. And she's pretty weak has no fighting ability whatsoever, bluffing all the way through, making people do stuff for her and commanding an army. The concept is wacky enough that I was on board. I didn't mind the whole vampire aspect. The animation's pretty solid. It's done by Project Number no. 9. I think this is easily one of their best efforts. The animation's solid. It's It, it has a nice color palette and great character designs. This is a comedy first and foremost, and Terakorami Gandas Blood is a really funny protagonist. I enjoy her reactions to all the craziness that's happening. These characters don't take everything so seriously. There is some etchy, raunchy humor throughout, specifically with Terakomari's maid and all that. But overall, I think it's a it's, it's a fun show. It gets unnecessarily convoluted later on with dozens of characters being introduced, but it's still fun. I, I do recommend it if you want something a little quirkier on your uh, anime watching. Shangri-La Frontier. 
Another one of those modern manga that people like to talk about that I haven't checked out, but the anime is done from one of my favorite studios, C2C. I think they are highly underrated. Wonderful illustrations here. They really do bring the manga to life in a fantastic way. And it is essentially a gaming adventure series. I'm not a fan of those. I, at first I thought it was an isekai, but no, this is just the character playing a VR, state-of-the-art VR game called the uh, Shangri-La Frontier. Uh, Rakuro is the main character. He is known as the crap gamer where he enjoys going through awful shitty games so that he can appreciate the god tier ones when they come about. Now he's on this expansive VR world that is super realistic but what I take issues with is the fact that at the end of the day I don't feel I don't feel worried about these characters because it is a game. I don't see it as a life or death scenario and like if they get into trouble for something I'm like well it's just a game they can just reset it start over so that's why I typically dislike manga and anime based on uh, video games. I know some people said like, this gets the real gamer. I don't know about that. I'm a gamer. I've been playing video games since the NES back in the day. And I don't know, I don't behave <laughs> the certain in a certain way as depicted on this show. But still, this turned out to be quite fun. I like experiencing that VR world through Rakuro and his first time playing it, getting to know all the characters and lore and all that stuff. Certain things that he does, yeah, I do agree. It's very accurate to modern day gamers. And overall, it's just a fun time. I really enjoyed the first story arc and seeing how he reacts to all the different characters that are out to get him because he is good at the game and is unlocking stuff that they didn't even know about and NPC characters that they had no idea existed and story elements within the game that are brand new. So he really put a target on his back. The Family Circumstances of the Irregular Witch. This is a comedy slice of life ONA, original net animation, where you have the character of Alyssa, a witch. The, she's living in this magical fantasy world and she finds a young baby and decides to adopt her, naming her Viola. And the two grow up together as mother and daughter. Just so happens now in present time, Viola looks much older where she's in fact 16. And that's the butt of many of the jokes in this, the age discrepancy and especially with the looks. And it's mostly just very slice of life oriented with wacky premises with each episode, how there's an insomnia episode or there's a dating episode or there's one about uh, fishing in a lake with monsters or going gardening and seeing like butt fairies or fart fairies, I should say. It's wacky stuff like that. Some of the episodes, I feel like the comedy doesn't stick the landing, but for the most part, it was sincere in its silliness that I kept watching and found myself entertained. The animation's nice. It's not a thing too flashy, but it gets the job done. So if you want something kooky and wacky with some interesting concepts, if you like the whole uh, European-based fairy magical mythology with like stuff like uh, fairies and magical mushrooms and phoenix creatures and witches, you'll be right at home here with uh, the family circumstances of the irregular witch. Overtake is an original series by A. Aoki and it is animated by Troika. I was not expecting to be completely enamored by this series, but I think it's one of the best shows of 2023. No joke. This is an anime about Haruka Asahina, a 16 year old high schooler who is racing in the F4 league. You know how there's Formula One? Well, there's also Formula Two, Three, and Four, Four being the slowest if I remember correctly, and he is staying at a small auto body shop that is participating in the races, but they don't have a lot of money and the car is not necessarily the fastest, but Haruka has some trauma from his father being a uh, Formula One race car driver. Unfortunately, his dad passed away and Haruka feels like racing is part of his legacy, so he wants to do that and honor his father. At the start of the series, we meet other supporting cast members that uh, really do get involved with this small outer body shop, the uh, mechanic and the owner of said shop. And there is a photographer that shows up that 
befriends them and starts working with them to highlight their races and get their story out there. And this character is called Koya. Koya has a fascinating traumatic story that uh, really engrossed me. I thought it was fantastic and really well done. Uh, this is a very drama heavy show with racing being the backdrop that ties everything together. The racing is well done. I like the fact that since it's F F4, you don't have to focus too much on getting the proper speed right of the races. These are slower cars from F1, so it sort of gets a pass. I thought that was pretty clever. The animation is beautiful. I love the character designs, and I think the story is well written. It has a good premise, a fun execution, and a wonderful fit. The 100 Girlfriends who really, 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 really love you, finally released. I was really anticipating this, no pun intended. I like the premise of the manga, so I was wondering how they were going to tackle that with the anime. And for the most part, this was a huge success. Biburi Animation Studios, I think they knocked it out of the park. Such a wacky premise, such a silly manga, but it's executed really well. The comedy's on point. The characters are great. They are smartly written. And the gag, visual comedy, and joke and all that stuff that happens in this show, I think it's top tier. Some of the jokes are laugh out loud funny to me. The premise may not be for everybody, but give it a shot and just suspend your disbelief, disengage, turn your brain off, and just enjoy the raunchy comedy that ensues. I think you're going to have a fun time. It doesn't take itself too serious. It pokes fun at itself and the rom-com genre to create a very unique harem type show, but the characters, specifically the girls that fall in love with Rentaro, they're not hopeless bimbos. They have personalities, they have stories that are worth examining and worth finding out about. So essentially Rentaro, he's been rejected a hundred times in middle school and now after visiting a shrine, praying for better luck, he's been blessed by the god of love who appears and says that he'll soon meet a hundred people destined to... But the catch is that once destiny introduces the two of them, they must happily love each other. If they don't, they will die. So now Rentaro has a job of befriending and falling in love genuinely with a hundred girls. That is insane. That is bonkers. But they pull it off really well. In this first season at least, I really enjoyed it. So I'm looking forward to more of the 100 girlfriends who really, really, you know the drill. Berserk of Gluttony. Oh boy. <laughs> Uh, I, I didn't want to check it out, but I was kind of intrigued. I saw the visual key and thought, okay, sure, whatever, I'll check it out. In it, we follow the character of Fate. He has a magical skills shape that is called Gluttony, where he has this unending hunger, and not just uh, physically, but for the fighting as well, where he must consume and consume and gain all these stats. He can never level up. He'll always stay level one, but he'll gain the abilities of the vanquished foes. So this is a dark fantasy world that is ruled by this kingdom with royal knights that aren't necessarily the best characters. A powerful force that a lot of people fear them. Fate wants to change that. When he realizes of his magical ability, he also finds a sword that can talk to him. There's a spirit inside or something like that, and the two form a friendship and a bond as he sort of becomes this dark knight vigilante character going out there and murdering creatures and gaining their ability, and uh, it's one of those shows. It got paired with ACGT, and this studio I'm not a fan of. The quality and talent is there. Unfortunately, Berserk of Gluttony suffers because this just looks bad. <laughs> I dislike the characters. I dislike the, the actual designs, I should say, the animation. It was just very mid-2000s, and not in a good way. We also saw the conclusion of Dark Gathering, a series that I really fell in love with. I love the premise where you have the small Yayoi being a defiant girl in the face of adversity of an otherworldly supernatural presence. You have this giant supernatural phenomenon, this giant creature thing that I can't quite describe, and it captured Yayoi's mother 
when she sadly passed away and now won't let her soul pass on and all that stuff. So Yayoi is going after this thing and building a spirit army of her own with the most evil looking spirits that you've seen and uh, she's going to fight this creature and there are other characters involved that want to put a stop to that. This was a mix of action but mostly horror and I think it does the spooky stuff really well. Some of the episodes I was genuinely freaked out so much that I went ahead and picked up the manga and I'm reading it. So yeah, I really enjoyed Dark Gathering. I think it's a solid show. OLM did a good job. Not their best work, but I think it's solid. I think you should check it out. They really do a nice job of accentuating the horror elements and the spooks and jump scares and all that stuff and bringing you really interesting, horrific slice of life stories with the character of Yayoi and the uh, backups being uh, Keitaro and Eiko. Their stories are interesting as well, but definitely enjoyed this series for uh, the main lead here of Yayoi Hozuki. Now, before I talk about some special shows that I watched, I want to give a moment for the dearly departed, the canceled or dropped shows that didn't make the list for this fall review. Thank you for your service, I guess. And since this video is long enough, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but some of the specials I watched include the Attack on Titan final chapters, which I thought were great. Some other original net animations that I watched include Pluto, adapting the manga from the same name from Naoki Urusawa, which was just phenomenal really did the original manga justice, beautifully animated, and it's a shame that it didn't get the hype it deserved, because this is one of the best shows of the year. Akuma-kun finally came back in a new anime adaptation of the manga of the same name from one of my favorite creators, Shigeru Mizuki. I think it's solid, and it sucks that a lot of people skip this because Netflix, you know, they just drop shows all at once, and I hate that. You much rather do the weekly format to get more people involved and promote the show and get more eyes on the screen watching this. But Akuma-kun, really lovely adaptation. I think it's solid, really spooky at times, fun, quirky, action-y, and really pays homage to another great manga created by uh, the legendary Shigeru Mizuki. Finally, Oku, The Inner Chambers, one of the most interesting releases of the year that got little to no attention simply because Netflix. <laughs> also, there are a lot more elements involved that I'm not going to get into, specifically with the story and how the anime crowd perceived it, but that's a that's a topic for another manga tuber out there that can cover it better than I can. But Oku is a wonderful shoujo, gender-bending, political, historical fiction series that I highly highly recommend with some really smart plays on the whole doomsday scenario where one gender is at risk of going extinct so the other steps up and is creating this new society based on the matriarchy. So we follow the Edo period in Japan where a new disease begins to prey on the country's men. Within eight years of the first outbreak, the population has fallen to a quarter of the total female population and now women have taken on all the roles traditionally granted to men, even that of the shogun. So yeah, you really gotta watch this. It has some some smart commentary and some great dynamics with the roles being reversed. I think it's uh, easily one of the best shows to watch this year. So there you go. That is my review, I guess, for the season. Sort of my quick thoughts on each of these shows. It's a long episode. I do apologize. But yeah, 30 plus shows. That's a lot. It's a it's a labor of love. And I thank you if you watch this video. I truly do appreciate it. But we're not done. I'm going to give you now my top 20 anime of 2023.
So there it is, my top 20 anime of 2023. It was an amazing year once again for animation, for anime specifically. A lot of wonderful things aired. I'm so happy that I was able to watch all these shows, even the bad ones. I didn't mind it. And I'm looking forward to next year to see what it brings. I'm so happy that we live in such a golden age of animation and to see all these projects come to light and adapting all these wonderful manga, just a real treat. I hope you enjoyed this super long episode. It was pretty exhausting, not gonna lie. So if you give out a like on this video, I'd appreciate it. You know, help a brother out. Subscribe if you haven't. If this is the first time you're watching, I do thank you. I do content on mostly manga, but I appreciate the view. Thank you everybody so much. God bless. Stay safe out there. I will catch all of you on our next video.